Hi guys and welcome to uh, another edition of Darkwood Bushcraft. This is a garden edition today because obviously at the moment we are under lockdown because of the COVID-19 issue. Um, so what we're going to look at today is something that, uh, that you can do with very few resources that you can do in the comfort of your own homes um, and something that's actually really useful and that is a tri-stick. Now these were originally the uh, the concept of Moors Kachansky, a, uh, a very very famous bushcrafter who unfortunately uh, passed away last year. But the purpose of these was to a teach you different and useful cuts and notches that you can use um, in bushcraft. But secondly, there it also is there to give you practice and comparison with different knives. Um, it teaches you manual dexterity, it teaches you what your knife is and isn't capable of. Um, one of the reasons I tend to do them is just to see what limitations a particular knife uh, may have compared to other knives. Now you can't compare this from one person to another, so the, the tri-stick that I do with a given knife isn't necessarily going to tell you what you can do with a given knife. With that same knife you might do a better or worse job. But it, what it can tell you is a comparison between your own knives. So this particular one um, I tend to use for demonstration. Uh, this was best case scenario, so it was done with an actual carving knife, a very, very fine, thin Scandinavian blade. Um, I believe it's probably a Mora. Um, so obviously all the notches are fairly tight. It's quite a small stick. Um, there's some notches in there that I wouldn't necessarily use or teach with, but they're there nonetheless. Um, what we're going to do today is something a little bit different. Normally, I wouldn't even bother doing this with um, something that comes under the, the survival knife category. But today we're going to do it with an SE5. Now, this video has two parts to it, essentially. The first part is to show you the notches and show you how you can achieve those different cuts and notches. But the second part is really to see what can be achieved with a bigger blade. Um, a lot of people carry, like to carry a single blade option if they can, which is usually a knife of, of, of bigger dimensions because it can handle chopping and things like that, heavy duty work. Um, but having a go of, of uh, a tri-stick with your bigger knife will also give you a much more realistic um, option as to whether or not you need to carry a smaller knife as a partner with it. So. What we're going to do today is we're going to go through these a notch at a time and we're going to see exactly what we can actually achieve with a knife of this size um, and see how capable it is as a standalone piece. So without further ado, let's crack on. Okay, so the first notch that we are going to do on our tri-stick today is the, um, the rounding of the end. This is quite a straightforward way of starting. Um, it's a fairly easy one to do. This is quite handy when you're doing things like temp pegs and stuff like that, anything that is going to be subjected to any kind of impact. Uh, because what tends to happen if you don't do this, if you just have a flat edge, when you're hitting something you tend to hit the edges of it, which will cause it to split, um, therefore destroying your temp peg or whatever fairly quickly. So um, that, that's one of the uses for this, but it's again just quite a handy uh, little technique to know. So here we go. So we're going to start off just by using our thumb just to push against the back of the blade. And as you can see that does most of the work for us. Um, we're just going to begin by taking off just small amounts of wood. Don't try and take off too much wood when you're doing something like this. As soon as you have to start applying a lot of pressure you will find that you will very quickly start to lose control of your knife which means that if it slips with that amount of pressure um, that's when you like to cause an injury. So just take little bits of wood off, there's no rush after all, this is um, 
one of those things that you want to enjoy doing so I'm just going up now and just chipping away at the corners and I'm just taking off those hard corners just a little bit at a time just to start to create that kind of rounded end now you're going to notice straight away that the difference between the tri-stick that I showed you earlier and the one we're doing here is that this one has got bark on it um, one of the things that was suggested in the original tri-stick that it be done in willow and before you start your tri-stick you take off the bark and you use it to create cordage afterwards um, which is absolutely fine nothing wrong with that at all but that's a completely different skill as far as I'm concerned cordage is for another day we're just talking about knife skills here so um, making cordage out of the bark is, isn't that relevant um, the main reason though I've left the bark on this today is really for the camera so that you can see what's going on um, it's much easier to see where I'm cutting if you've got that contrast between the, uh, the bark and the interior wood so there's our rounded end hopefully the camera will focus on that So, on to our next cut. Okay, the uh, the next notch we're going to look at is this one here, which is the um, the curved notch. Now, this is a notch that's very useful if you're making a pack frame um, or something along those lines, and you want to to lash different bits of wood together. Um, it'll create a very stable position with which to start lashing. Um, your separate pieces of wood. It's also something you could potentially use for um, log cabin building, that sort of thing. So it's it's quite a handy notch, but what, this one in particular um, teaches us quite a lot of dexterity with the tip of our knife, so let's give it a go. Now, I'm not going to start quite so far near the edge of the stick with this one because I'm going to want to turn this around and hold on to this end of the stick while I'm working potentially. So I'm going to come down a little bit. Because it's a bigger knife I'm not expecting to be able to get in quite so tight as I could with the other one but we'll give it a go. So how we're going to start is we're just again we're going to use the tip of the knife and we're just going to start pushing with our thumb and at the same time I'm making a sort of scooping action with the knife. Now I'm only going down halfway and then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to do the other side from here. Now the reason that we do that is because fibres in the wood cut much much better under compression. When we're pressing down across the fibres and cutting they cut cleanly. As soon as we start to try and lift the fibres out what will happen is we'll get splitting all the way along the wood um, and you won't get your neat joint. So when I need to go the other way I turn the wood around and I work from the other direction. And I just scoop out a little bit one way and then a little bit the other way. I'm actually quite pleasantly surprised with how much dexterity that this knife affords us. Um, I didn't think we'd be able to get in quite as tight as this. But it just goes to show if your knife is sharp enough it can be achieved. That brings me on very neatly to um, a conversation about having a sharp knife. A sharp tool, you've probably heard lots of people say it, a sharp tool is much safer than a blunt tool. And the reason for that is because if your tool is sharp, you don't have to apply a lot of pressure to get it to do the work you want it to do. As soon as your knife is blunt, you're going to have to really push on that knife to get it to do what you want it to do. Which means the minute it slips, it's going to slip with a lot more velocity behind it than if it was sharp. So, 
it's very important that you you keep your knife as sharp as possible at all times um, and learn how to maintain it you know if you're going to be a knife owner it's important that you know how to keep that knife in tip top condition for when you want to use it there we go there's our curved notch so we'll move on to the next one So what we're going to look at now is what's known as the figure 7 notch. Um, as you can see, it looks like a 7 from the side, hence the name. Now, the importance of this notch is having this flat top. This notch is designed so that you can hook things with it, but that they can be released very, very easily. This is the sort of notch you're likely to use in a trigger trap something that's sprung so under tension it'll hold but the minute it's nudged it comes off there's your trigger it's quite an easy notch to do um, so let's give it a go okay so we're going to start this notch by putting in what we call a stop cut and a stop cut is exactly that it's a cut that will stop the next cut so that you don't split your wood. So we've gone straight down on rocking the knife from side to side. Now this is the first time really that I've noticed the huge difference between a big knife and the small carving knife. Because of the width of the blade here and what a wedge it forms, it's quite difficult to force it into the wood. So these stop cuts are actually quite difficult to do deep. So we'll just have to go over it a few times in order to get the stop cut to the depth that we want. But as you can see, by gently then shaving up towards the stop cut, we don't go any further than we want to. Now, I just go in a little bit deeper with the stop cut, and what I'm doing here is I'm creating a shoulder, um, the one edge of the notch that we're cutting up against will form the top of our trigger. So you can see I'm taking off very, very fine slithers. I'm not taking off much wood at all. I'm doing all the work with the tip of the blade. Just taking it off as I go, keeping that nice and flat, nice and square. I'm just going to trim that nice and level. You have to make sure you're at 90 degrees and not at a slope otherwise your notch won't work at all because whatever you put whenever you put it under tension it will just slip straight off so there we go Figure seven notch. Okay, now we're going to look at what we would call a reduction. Now, a reduction is exactly that. It's a reduction in the diameter of the piece of wood that you're using. These are quite useful potentially for toggles or for if you, if you take this part away, um, you can create pegs that can go into holes, that sort of thing. Um, again, myriad of uses. Uh, but it, this is a little bit more fiddly than the last few so let's see how we get on so again this time what we're going to do is we're going to start with another stop cut and this time we're going to go all the way around our limb try and get the two ends to meet up if you can and I'm going to go around this a couple of times just to make sure that we've got through the bark and into the wood underneath. There we go. Now I'm going to do the same again the other side. So this is the two shoulders that we're going to create for our reduction. Right, so now I'm gently, and I mean gently, just going to 
start to generate these two end shoulders. Now this is the point where you're likely to um, overdo it and chip the wood away further up here and then you've got to either make your reduction longer and do a new shoulder or you've got to start again. So take your time, nice and easy and don't forget, go back round, take off all those little chips I'm just going to establish a decent shoulder this side and then we'll go over to the other side and then we'll look about at how we are going to start reducing the wood in between the two edges. One of the things that I have noticed doing this with a much bigger knife is that um, it tires your hand out a lot quicker. I'm just going to turn this around and start working the other way. The, uh, the, the thickness of the blade um, means that I'm having to apply more energy in my cuts than I would with a very very fine blade especially a blade with um, a grind specifically designed for carving like something like a Scandinavian grind um, which comes down to a very 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 fine edge um, which would be no good for something like this for a survival knife because it would just destroy the edge the minute you started to do any heavy chopping or anything like that with it um, but is obviously ideal for carving now it's designed to pass through wood fibres very easily, whereas this is designed to be a bit more multi-purpose. And like any knife in life, the more specialised it is, the better it's going to do its job. Um, when you're talking about bigger survival knives, more often than not, you're looking at something that needs to be a bit of a jack of all trades. So it doesn't tend to be exceptional at any particular one thing which is absolutely fine because that's what it's designed for um, but certainly this with it being a sabre grind um, the angles are much steeper so what is actually happening is it means that it won't pass through the wood fibres quite as easily and therefore is a little bit harder to work with so we've reduced the shoulders down either side so what I'm going to do now is start to take out the wood in the middle between the two. Now again, take your time doing this because this is where you're again likely to go into the shoulders and ruin the work that you've already done. So take your time and work at it nice and slowly. So we're just working our way round the notch. Evening it out across the width. Turn it around and just do the other side. So, like I mentioned in the introduction, what this actually tells me is how this knife compares to other knives that I use. It doesn't really tell me anything about how good the knife is. It won't tell anybody else how good the knife is, but it does give me a comparison um, to other knives that I have done this exercise with. Like any tool, it's all about practice. 
you'll find that um, a lot of knife users fidget with their blades constantly. It's the bane of my wife's life that I'll be sat in front of the television and she'll just hear this click, 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 click of me opening, closing, folding knives and just just playing with them. It just get, gets you familiar with their weight in your hand and how they handle and the importance of constantly practicing your skills is vital. The last thing you want to do is be in a, an emergency situation with a tool that you've never used before and no amount of training. You know, train for your emergencies when you don't need to train for your emergencies. And then when they come about, you're familiar with the tools that you're using. So, we're nearly there now. I'm just going to tidy this up a little bit. It doesn't have to be too neat at this stage because otherwise you're all going to be bored out of your tree waiting for me to get this perfect. So there we go, happy with that. One reduction. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay, the next one we're going to look at is the dovetail notch. Um, this is the one I'm a little bit uh, wary about with the SE5 uh, because this is probably the trickiest of all of them. This is quite a fiddly notch to do. Um, it's a jointing notch, so you would put a triangular section piece through it. Um, it gives you a very solid joint that doesn't come out, so it kind of locks the joint in place. So it's, it's a it's a great little notch, but it's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, there, there's easier notches that do similar things, but it's a great one for the purposes of this exercise and for testing your knife. So let's give it a go. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start this notch by doing stop cuts like we did previously with the figure seven. Um, but we're going to put the, do them in at a 45 degree angle. So I'm going to go in at an angle. I'm just going to roll the blade side to side about halfway. I'm going to try and keep it in that line. And then I'm just going to gently cut up to that stop cut. Now you really do have to be gentle here because this stop cut is not coming down at 90 degrees it's quite shallow so it's not initially going to be very effective as a stop cut so if you apply too much pressure the first thing you're going to do is just cut that stop cut away so once I've got that started I can start to cut that in deeper and deeper and just slowly chip away at it once we've got a bit of a, a shoulder there it takes the pressure off a little bit and allows us to work a little bit quicker. Now this is this is quite hard going with this knife. Um, this sort of undercutting is quite fiddly and this is a big old blade so I'm trying to work as much with the tip of the blade as I possibly can so that gives me the most control so I'm happy with that as a starting point so I'm now going to do the other side and I'm going to go in very close to the first notch do the same thing again I think this might actually be the biggest knife that I've actually done a tri stick with normally the first thing you do when you're demonstrating a tri stick is go for your carving knife or at least a sort of Scandinavian bushcraft, Scandinavian grind bushcraft knife. 
because that's what they're designed for and inevitably when you're teaching bushcrafters that's what they have as well so this tends to be used more as a a teaching aid for knife skills rather than a a comparison of knives so it makes quite a nice change for me to try this with a bigger blade so we've got a little bit of a shoulder cut away so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to try and level that that end off where I need it to be and I'm just going to again I'm using my thumb to direct the knife with my, with my left hand I'm holding and supporting the knife with my right hand but it's the, the thumb of my left hand that's really kind of directing the knife to where it needs to go um, it gives me a lot more control over what I'm doing because the pressure I'm applying is very slow and very slight so I've established where I want the base of that notch to be so now we've just got to work our way down each side until we get there now I'm going to start scooping like I did with the the round notch just to try and get down to that baseline and I'm going to keep working from side to side a little bit at a time I'm not too worried about it looking pretty at this stage I just want it to be functional I must admit I am very impressed at the moment with um, just how much this SE5 is capable of um, for a knife this size. It's always been a bit of a favourite of mine. Um, like I say, I've never attempted anything like this with it before. I tend to um, always carry a big knife with a, a small companion, usually a folder, um, and that obviously would be the first one, first knife I would reach for if I was uh, going to do something like this. I wouldn't pick up the, the big knife to do this, uh, it wouldn't occur to me. But I was thinking about it the other day and I was thinking that actually if you were in a situation where you'd lost everything except for the knife that you had on you you've got to be able to do or if your other knife breaks or you lose it you've got to be able to do all the tasks that you want to do with the one knife you have now I've never been a, a, a big strong believer in the whole one tool system I think that's just bad practice I think ultimately unless you have to use one tool you should have the right tools for the right job um, but you might find yourself in a position where that is not a choice so it's very useful to know just what you can and can't do with your main tool 
Oh, we're nearly there now. So I'm just flattening off. That bottom surface. There you go, like I say, it's not pretty. But it's functional. There we go. One dovetail joint. Okay, after that one, this one should be a breeze. What we're doing now is a square notch. Now this again can be used like the round notch to lock two bits of wood together. If you put a square notch in each piece, um, you then create a really strong um, cross member that won't slide this way or this way. Whereas with this one, you've only got to carve the notch in the one side, you can put the next piece on straight on, but it will still potentially slide in this direction. It stops this lateral motion, but it will basically slide longitudinally. So the square notch stops that from happening. So we'll look at that next. So as I'm sure you were suspecting, we're going to start with a stop cut. So I'm going to put two stop cuts in, which are going to create the shoulders of the square notch. And we're just going to feed into them like this. Now, the other thing that this is all about is not just about understanding your knife. It's also about understanding the material that you're working with, the wood that you're working with. Understanding how to cut grain, understanding which woods are best for for carving. I mean, trying to do this with um, something like a seasoned oak or something along those lines, you're going to have a very, very different job on your hands than doing it with something like this. This is actually um, green sycamore that I'm using currently. So, what we're also doing here, when we've got our stop knot either side, is I'm just popping the grain off. You see how easily that comes away? So we just that's how we get rid of our middle bit and of course we've got the stop knot to stop it splitting further stop cut, sorry stop knot I'm talking about getting my knots and my cuts confused so I'll keep cutting into them keep cutting up to them to the depth that I want to go chipping little bits away as I go you see I've got this apex in the middle and that just a bit of pressure with the thumb that comes straight off so I can then flatten the base of my notch both directions tidy it up sure it's even on both sides there we go there's our square notch okay moving on we are going to do another reduction similar to the round reduction but this time we're going to do a square reduction um, this is a little bit more tricky than the round reduction and requires a little bit more control but let's give it a go okay 
again I'm going to put my stop cuts in and we're going to go again all the way around our limb join it up if we can right then we're going to pick a top plane so this is going to be our top edge so essentially what I'm going to start off with is something very similar to my figure 7 notch so I'm just going to cut in a flat side not too deep The trick with this one is to get it even all the way around. So I want to make sure that I'm not too deep but I'm deep enough that when I take the sides off as well all the corners meet up. So I'm now going to do the same in the other direction, make sure it's level. So essentially what we're doing here is we're creating a square notch that doesn't go quite as deep but effectively travels in all four directions, so on all four sides of the limb. So that's the first bit. two sides first before I go around the back Same the other side. comes to the edge on your survival knife um, there is a school of thinking which was actually made popular by um, the great lofty wiseman in the 80s which is that you should potentially sharpen your knife in a different way across the whole length of the blade um, this comes from this whole single tool thinking um, and you could see why it was important to keep both the top sort of inch of your blade and the bottom two inches near the handle as sharp as physically possible because they're the ones that do all the delicate work it's also why bushcrafters don't tend to like blades that have a serration over these bottom two inches because you will do a lot of work like feather sticking and things like that is all done here close to the, the hand because it actually gives you mechanical advantage if you're out here there's a lot more pressure happening on your wrist as you push down that you can avoid by keeping your hand close to where you're working um, so that area and that area should be sharp this area here however it suggested that maybe you you let that get a little less sharp than the rest of the blade the reason being is that is the area of the knife that does most of the heavy chopping um, and therefore is most likely to actually take edge damage 
Now you notice on some survival knives they will actually have um, the different areas of the blade almost segregated um, to the point where you can sharpen all three separately almost as three separate tools um, which is fine but again it's um, it's reducing the versatility of your tool the more specialized it is the less versatile it is so in my mind the best thing to do is to get a good grind throughout the whole knife that will do all of those tasks not the best but adequately and I think the uh, the SE5 achieves that fairly well I mean as you can see we're managing quite nicely to deal with the whole um, carving situation so it's clearly sharp enough for that but I've done some pretty heavy work with this knife as well and um, it's never taken any serious edge damage at least nothing that I couldn't just quickly touch up with a diamond stone in the field so um, yeah I reckon I reckon they've got it pretty good as far as uh, general purpose survival knives go they've pretty much nailed it I think with the SE5 um, it's a beast of a knife and no doubt about it it's a heavy old blade um, but as you can see it's also more than capable of doing finer work as well okay we're nearly there I'm just squaring it up now as you can see I'm not spending too much time to get it perfect just going to get it more or less square you get the general idea so there we go a square reduction now we're nearly there a couple more to do so the next one we're going to look at is the pot hanger notch now this is this differs from the figure 7 notch um, insofar as it undercuts because the pur purpose of this knot is to notch is to actually make sure that whatever you hang on it stays on it so you don't want that slipping off or anything like that um, this is also a great notch for tent pegs um, so it's very similar but with this one we're going to have a curve and an undercut so let me show you how this is done okay now back to talking about knowing your material you will notice that here we have a little knot so I'm going to avoid that because the wood behind a knot is usually much more dense um, and the grain doesn't follow the, the nice straight pattern so it's a lot harder to work so we're going to come down from there um, and I'm going to work on this section here for the next notch so we're doing the uh, pot hanger notch now the stop cut for this one we're going to use a cross so we're going to go across at 45 degrees and then we're going to go across that cut at 45 degrees as well now again, like with um, the dovetail knot notch up here, um, we're going to be very careful when we're removing material from this one. But we're going to take the wood back up to the top part of the cross that we've just made, and then work that in. Now, don't worry at this stage about the undercut just cut straight down we're going to deal with the undercut once we've got the notch in place so at the, for the time being I'm just cutting up to the stop knots uh, stop stop cuts Thank you. 
working up into that position from stop cut to cut until I get the depth that I want for this particular notch started to expose the pith in the centre here, you can see that, which means I've probably gone a little bit too deep. Um, it won't matter unless it was, if it was a tent peg I might be uh, rethinking it a little bit, just because we might have created a weak point, um, but for the sake of this exercise it doesn't really matter. But be mindful of that, be mindful of where you're cutting. Your, your pith is a good... Um, indicator of how deep you're going as you can see we've exposed quite a lot of it here so we've got our notch now all we need to do is create the undercut so I'm going to go up to the top here and I'm actually going to start trimming away from side to side going up in both sides and then up the middle to start to create our undercut. Take that bark off. And you can see where the pith is all crumbly and rubbish. So I've gone a bit deep there. But there you go, you get the idea. So the importance with this one is to start with your cross. Okay, one more notch to do, and then we'll do the end section. I'm not gonna do this fancy, fancy notchy cutty thingy on the end here. What we're gonna do instead is we're gonna do a wedge um, with a uh, root stripper, which is the more traditional way of finishing off your um, tri-stick. But first of all we're going to do the last notch which is the V-notch. Now this can be used for similar things as the um, circular notch up here. It's just a good way of locating something in a groove so that it doesn't rock from side to side. This is much more useful for something that's going to have a lot of downward pressure on it. So if you were building a a pack frame I would use something like this because potentially things can pop out of this one much much easier so if you're building something like a, a log bench or something like that this would be ideal because you'd have your cross members but all the forces would be going down through it you wouldn't be getting too much lateral force um, and obviously this is much much quicker and easier to do than the round one so V notch. Okay, surprise, surprise, we're going to start with a stop cut. This time, though, the stop cut is in the middle of our notch. So, what we're going to do is work down to the stop cut on one side. Turn it around. And then we're going to work down to the stop cut on the other side. So going from side to side. V notch. Okay, 
Okay, so this is the last bit of our tri-stick. Um, all the tough bits have been done now, so um, I'm really pleased with how the uh, the SE5's worked out. So what we're going to create here is we're going to create an even taper going both sides down like a wedge with a nice square end and then we're going to have a v-notch cut into that square end which is going to be used for stripping um, the outside coating off roots and things like that. So we're not just going to hack at this because we want to do this under control. So again I'm going to put in a stop cut. Um, I'm going to go all the way around and this is something that you can do um, at any point on a limb if you're trying to cut it off at a certain point in a controlled way and you don't just want to make a hacked up mess of it. So we're going to use the stop cut and we're going to cut into the stop cut and we're going to do that. At quite a shallow angle so keep your your cuts nice and fine nice and controlled and then we're going to go opposite this one and we're going to do it this side As you can see, this side is a lot thinner than this side, which means that our notch is tipping to one side. So we're going to even it up by taking more off this edge. Keep those cuts nice and flat. And this edge. That's much better already. Now we can flatten it up. And we're just going to keep going from one side to the other side. this side and as you can see we're getting we've hit the pith, pith both sides actually we're almost at the point where we're through so we give that a little wiggle off it comes so in a nice controlled manner we've managed to cut the end off the wood without hacking it now this is a cut that I haven't shown you yet what we're going to do is we're going to use pressure with our thumb to cut a nice square end on this now, what you'll see a lot of people who are unfamiliar with knives doing is pressing down directly over the blade. That makes me twitch like a rabbit's nose. That's only going to end up in a horrible, horrible accident. What we're going to do is we're going to apply pressure with our thumb, but we're going to apply it at the side of the blade, and we're going to use our fingers. So what we're actually going to be doing is this. We're going to be doing creating like a a fist action, a grabbing action and a pushing with our thumb and a rolling with our fingers to get that pressure but at no point is that knife going anywhere near our thumb. So we apply the pressure with the thumb, we've got the knife here and I'm going to use the, the fingers braced against that thumb to create our nice square edge. So there's literally no way I'm going to cut my thumb with this knife. Um, so that's a, quite a handy one to know because it's actually a very strong cut because you're using the pressure of your fist to create the cut. So we've got our nice little wedge, we've got our nice little square end. Um, what we do have, we have a bit of pith off here which is going to be a, a, a weak spot. Um, and what we want to do now is we want to create a V in the end of this and we're going to do that so that we can use it to 
strip roots but more to the point the V is quite a tricky one to do without splitting the wood so what we're going to do is we're going to actually cut down the middle ever so gently now I'm just going to rock the blade because it's such a thick blade what I don't want to be doing is splitting those fibres apart too much I want to actually be just creating a cut going down so that's far enough that's that's about I suppose six seven mil now I'm gonna just use a gentle trimming just to bring that in I'm only gonna do a little bit at a time because again I don't want to create a big split There we go. Now I can go a little bit further in. Now the rocking rather than the pressure means that I don't, if this splits suddenly, nothing's going to happen. If I apply pressure and this splits suddenly, I'm going to go straight into my hand with this knife. So again, always be wary of how you apply pressure and where your knife is going to go if it slips. So that bit just split off then, which is what we we're trying to avoid. So if you notice, I'm actually slicing with the knife, not just pushing and cutting. So as the, as the wood gets thicker, this gets a bit trickier. There you go. So there you have it. Your finished tri stick. Which is a great way to uh, spend your time stuck indoors, minimum amount of materials required, minimum amount of resources, and it's great for honing those knife skills. And it's great for testing those knives that you maybe haven't used in a little while. Who knows, maybe you'll fall back in love with them again. Um, so, good luck to everybody. Stay safe and uh, we'll see you next time. Happy trails.